Galapagos, written by Lucas Hassel. Teaser. Black. Barely discernible. Closed eyes. Someone. Breathing. Life. Tranquility. Until, sharp as a razor, a warning alarm. Eyes open. Shiny dark orbs. Fixed straight ahead. You are dying. In the darkness, the eyes blink, taking in the statement. End alert. Alarm stops. Light. Red light comes on, inside a helmet. Extreme close-up on Dan, late forties, bearded, sweating. An odd prosthetic patch on his face, sealing a hole in his cheek. No, dumbass. Forward light. A beam of light punches on from the helmet. Dan's point of view. The light slashes through the blackness. We are underwater. A dark, barren sea floor. Pockets of white kelp. Attracted by the light, a lizard fish knocks into the visor. What the hell? End of Dan's POV. In a hard shell, deep sea diver's suit, the red light on Dan's face behind the visor is unsettling. Dan, what's going on? Your oxygen is really low. Dan's beam of light catches something in the sea bed silt. A small purple cube. Switching on exterior lights. No, Bram, the squid! The seabed area is lit up by massive floodlights, temporarily blinding him. And just like that, I'm bait. Release the probe, and get your butt back here. Adjusting to the floodlights, Dan picks up the small purple item in the silt. Not easy in the hard-shelled suit. Then, before heading in, he taps a small probe attached to his suit, and a tiny balloon inflates. With a blinking light, the probe rapidly rises through the water into the dark. Staying with the probe, we ascend. Up, up and directly below. In the large bubble of light, we see Dan heading back to a massive sub-oceanic station structure, most of it dark and derelict. Only a small wing evidences light and habitation. The station shrinks to a small dot of light far below as we continue to ascend. A giant squid's eye, then body, flashes by. Our ascension speeds up, leaving the slower blinking probe below. We continue upwards, faster and faster. Darkness. Darkness, then bluish ice, lighter ice, white ice, finally bursting through Earth's surface. Exterior surface of Earth, continuous. A flat, wind-blown, icy surface, endless, colored by dim orange light. If once there was life, now, as far as the eye can see, no buildings, no people, no civilization. The tiny sun is a faint dot on a cloudless, dark sky. Digital typing. The sun's magnetic field declined, sunspots stopped occurring, and the sun's heat became trapped under its crust. Earth froze over. Having exhausted all fuel options, polluting our planet's surface beyond repair, man turned to the oceans. The hot vents from Earth's molten core provided our last habitable place, the seabed. Today, the human race is on the brink of extinction. The swirling wind creates an eddy in the permafrost. Earth, 2437. Title card, Galapagos, Whiteout. Act 1, interior loading bay, upper level, moments later. Black, Dan's POV. Water runs down the visor as we slowly ascend into a tall room. Dim light, industrial, metallic. A ten-person submersible is suspended from the ceiling. On its side, platypus. A stocky man waits, angry. Bram, late forties, manly, premature balding, no nonsense. End of POV. Still on the diving platform, Dan removes his helmet. There are easier ways to kill yourself. You switched on the lights. 2% remaining ox oxygen. That's just stupid. Stupid. Got it. Lift. Dan lifts one leg, and Bram helps him out of the diver's suit. <sighs> Why is it so dark in here? Why do you stay out there so long? Dan stares at Bram. You really want to do this? The expanse feels good. Clear shot between me and sky. From containers on the suit, Dan empties collected white kelp into a bucket on the floor. He's done this many times before. 3,000 meters is a clear shot. Dan checks on a long row of jars along the wall, all carefully dated, fermenting kelp. It's claustrophobic in here. What's your point? At minus 80 degrees Celsius, it's a near instant death up there. You, of all people, should know that. Dan shivers in the cold. He knows Bram is right. We weren't meant to live down here. Bram softens. He throws Dan a blanket. Now! Dan doesn't understand. Lights are flicked on. Surprise! From the dark corners of the room and doorway, people step forward from various hiding places, dressed in all kinds of weird costumes, some 30 crew members. 
It takes a second for Dan to realize what's happening. Not pleased. He shoots Bram a reproachful glance. Happy birthday. A ragtime flapper girl, red, 20s, tough, gleefully approaches Dan with a costume in her arms. I'm not doing it. Don't be an ass. Red and Dan face off, neither backing down. Get on with it. Behind Red, an upright cocoon decorated as a butterfly glides forward on a ceiling rail. The cocoon is a life support system. Inside it, through a clear pane, Kentucky, 70s, a black woman with severe burn scars. A large banana, Captain Stewart, 70s, usually a tall, imposing man, approaches Dan. Tradition, son. Dan, we don't do the father-son thing, remember? Captain sucks it up. It's tradition, Dan. Screw tradition. Exasperated, Dan faces some of the main crew. A jellyfish and a squid, Charlotte and Laura, 50s, a fit lesbian couple, hold a very homemade-looking birthday cake. An LED light stuck on top. A female panther, Ash, 50s, long braided hair, stunning. A pirate, Drew, late teens, films the event on a device, an awkward physique like a puppy that grew too fast. A one-legged drag queen with a crutch, Butch, 40s, leaning up against the doorway. Not a handsome man, definitely not pretty dressed as a woman. A standoff. The silence is tangible. No one moves. Finally. Oh, fuck me. Dan snatches the costume from Red. She smiles overly sweet. He begrudgingly unzips it. Right arm pocket of the suit. The pirate, Drew, goes to the diver's suit and fishes out the purple cube Dan picked up from the seabed. A memory core? He's thrilled with the unexpected gift. Dan knew he would be. Probably useless, but... The jellyfish, Charlotte, proudly presents the cake to Dan. Make a wish. Blow out the candle. Annoyed, Dan zips up. He's a floppy-eared bunny. Charlie, it's an LED. Charlotte's smile wanes, disappointed. Just make a fucking wish and blow the fucking light out on the fucking cake that my wife took great fucking care in baking for you. The squid, Laura, stares the bunny, Dan, down until he picks up the LED and demonstratively blows it out, switches it off. Applause. Good, bunny. Dan flips her the bird, but to his annoyance, he realizes it's now hidden under the furry bunny hand. Then, behind Laura, in the doorway, someone makes Dan smile. Hey, scary clown! Everyone swivels around. In the doorway, in a futuristic wheelchair, a clown, sickly Lucy, 30s, and a sleeping baby, a love heart on his cheek, strapped across her chest. Well, I was just going for clown. The butterfly, Kentucky, glides along the ceiling rail. You shouldn't be out of bed, Lucy. Please, Doc, I won't stay long. Awkward silence, until Kentucky relents with a nod. Everyone turns to Dan, and from quiet to loud. Bunny! 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 Dan shakes his head at a smiling Bram. Hop to it. Incredulous, Dan Bunny hops into the hallway. Drew films with his handheld camera. Interior conference room, upper level, later. Empty cake bladder, not even a crumb left. What must have once been a large conference room, now decrepit, is filled with crew and music. Drew helps Dan pour a white kelp alcohol into shot glasses. They get passed around. Bram, now dressed as Elvis, watches Dan with concern. The captain stands. People quiet him down. Shh. We aren't much, but we may be all that's left. He raises his glass. To all 47 souls of us, mankind, station Galapagos. Galapagos! Galapagos. Everyone but Red drinks. Faces of disgust all around. The home brew is gross. Drew can barely hold it down. Kelpie! Butch is the only one who likes it. Just getting started. He hops over to Dan on his one leg, not easy in his drag queen dress. Another! Easy, Butch. Butch is instantly annoyed. Ignore my goody two-shoes, brother. Another shot! How badly do you want it, lady? Butch grabs Dan's man junk. A vice grip. I'm no lady. Ow! Hey! And I want it badly. Let go! I'm not kidding! My left nut! A drag queen and a bunny wrestle. Testosterone. Juvenile. Rowdy encouragement. Laughs. Interior hallway, upper level, later. Captain and Kentucky leave the party behind, and shutting the heavy door, instantly silence the music. They eye each other. That used to be us. I don't think so. Trust me. That was us. Captain puts his hand to the window in the cocoon. Kentucky puts her face to it. A sweet moment. Walk me home, sailor. Captain nods. 
Kentucky slides along a ceiling rail. The upper hallway was once elegant and sleek, now feels run down. Metal grid floor, submarine feel. They continue east past a laddered shaft going down. On the hallway walls on either side, dark, thick, round windows. In the space between windows are framed photos of what could be a long line of presidents. They pass the open loading bay doorway and the suspended submersible until they reach the end of the east hallway, a climate-controlled door to the laboratory sick bay. Kentucky presses a button and the door slides open. Hot air pours out. She and Captain step into a sally port and wait while one door shuts and another opens into interior lab, upper level, continuous. It's messy, humid. Plant seedlings line one wall. By another wall, a table with scientific instruments, cryogenic freezers, and general scientific layout. At the far end, a huge dark round floor to ceiling window. Captain and Kentucky eye their reflections. You hungry? I could go below. Kentucky indicates the far left corner. There, Lucy is asleep in a hospital bed hooked up to an IV, still wearing clown makeup, her baby in a cot nearby. Peaceful. She seems better. She won't live. Captain turns to Kentucky, somber. I can't stop the hemorrhaging. Bad news. Captain absorbs it. And the boy. Strong. Interior hallway, upper level, moments later. Captain Stewart emerges from the lab. He stops right outside the door, troubled, takes a deep breath, then checks his watch and moves on. He goes past the loading bay, and when he reaches the shaft, he grabs onto the ladder leading below. Interior hallway, lower level, continuous. Captain emerges from above, descending on the metal rungs. He steps off. The lower level is much rougher than above. Tubes and pipes line the interior. Steam puffs pierce the chilly temperatures. Dim lighting. From further below, the ladder continues down. The sound of a rhythmic swoosh. Otherwise, it's quiet. The hallway continues deep to the right, east, but to the left, directly under the conference room, a thick door with a small window. Through it, lush, plentiful green growth. Captain takes out a bright yellow bag from under his shirt and enters a code. The greenhouse door slides open and he quickly goes in. The door shuts behind him. Coming down the ladder, the sexy panther, Ash, and a crew member step off. They're all over each other as they turn down the east hallway, past various living quarter doors. When they get to Ash's room, they stumble in, kissing. They shut the door with a loud clank. Interior control room, upper level, later. No windows. Quiet. Maps on dividing glass partitions. Closets, desks, drawers. In her flapper costume, Red sits with a book by a large computer console singing to herself. The night shift. By her side, a piece of birthday cake. She eats it crumb by crumb, tasting each morsel. Slow eater. Captain is in the doorway. Red smiles. Thought you went to bed? The older I get, the less sleep I need. I could sleep all day. Listen, go back to the party. I got this. You sure? I'm sure. Red resolutely puts the slice of cake in a drawer. Don't let anyone near that. Station is yours. Red gives Stuart a high five and exits. As soon as Red is out of sight, Captain grows serious, checks the time, taps in some data, and then discreetly follows behind Red. Interior conference room, upper level, moments later. Rowdy music, bacchanalian atmosphere. Crew members dance. Red! Red is in the doorway, pleased at the loud welcome. Drew rushes over and pulls her out on the dance floor. Further over, the drag queen, Butch, has fallen asleep on his chair, wig askew. The squid, Laura, and the jellyfish, Charlotte, dance close, connected, in love. The bunny, Dan, dances by himself, teetering. Elvis, Bram, watches the bunny carefully until he finally gets up. All right, time for bed. Just then, the walls of the station shake briefly. A painting, is it really a Monet, drops off the wall. Everyone notices. Dancing stops. What was that? People wait to see if it happens again. It doesn't. A tremor? Dan is wasted. Smiles a big smile at Bram. You tremor. Gradually, crew members get back to partying. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our cue. Good night, all. Charlotte puts the painting back up as various people yell out good night. Come on, bunny. Interior hallway, upper level, continuous. Dan and Bram emerge from the conference room just as Captain emerges from the loading bay to the right. daddy -o! Bram is surprised to see Captain coming from the east. Red said you had the control room. I did. 
Uh, I do. Ken needed me in the lab for a second. No, no, no. You didn't come from the lab. I saw you. You came from loading bay. Then, Captain spots a small orange on the floor to the left, between him and the two men. Casually, he moves forward and steps on it before the men notice. Someone has had a lot of cowpaw. No truer words have ever been spoken. So I'll get him to bed. After you. Captain Stewart doesn't move. Smiles. You go ahead. Smell some. Let's go. Bram hikes up in Dan, and the men move to the ladder. Careful. What is that? Good night, Captain. Night. The men disappear down below, Dan babbling on as he manages to hold on to the rungs. Captain Smile wanes. He removes his foot from the squashed orange and picks it up. He licks the juice off his fingers as he thinks, concerned, then continues to the control room. Interior, Dan and Bram's room, lower level, moments later. Quiet, a small metallic room, two beds. A fake window gives the illusion of a sunny garden outside. An old scrambled Rubik's Cube, piles of haggard books, a messy desk with small tools and screws. The door is pushed open and Bram and Dan stumble in. Bram's pushed into one of the walls and car hood ornaments drop off the shelves. Oops, your, your car thingies. Hood ornaments. As Bram helps Dan get out of his costume, Dan tries to kiss him. Amorous. Nope. Come on, Alton. Elvis, arms. Fine. Dan tries to kiss Bram again, losing his balance. Just as it seems that he'll keel over, Dan catches himself. Orange! What? I smelled an orange upstairs! Good. Now, bed. Dan falls back onto the bed, half in, half out of his costume. I don't need you. I'm an island. He lies back, closing his eyes. Oh, my balls hurt. Bastard. Exhausted, Bram picks up the hood pieces and puts them back on their shelves, then plops down at his desk. He nudges a broken pair of sunglasses on the desk in the process of re restoration, lets his gaze brush over the walls. Shelves with sunglasses, old car hood ornaments, various knickknacks of the past. A large poster of Clotho 2098, a massive spaceship, as it zooms off above thousands of spectators. His eyes come to rest on the poster. What happened to you? Then grabbing a towel, he gets up. Exiting into the lower hallway, he runs a hand over the spaceship. Interior hallway, lower level, continuous. Loud love-making sounds from Ash's room. Grossed out, Bran turns left into the shower room. Two crew members pass by as they return to their rooms, worse for wear. Sound of a shower coming on from the washroom gym. Moving back up the hallway, back to the ladder, up. Interior hallway, upper level, continuous. More crew members head back, drunk. We move to the party in the conference room. Open door. Interior conference room, upper level, continuous. In the far corner, the painting, askew. A slow zoom in. What are we looking at? The Monet painting? Tighter. Above the painting, chipped paint on the wall? Tighter. A dried drop of paint on the wall? Tighter. A line? Tighter. Then, there it is. In the corner between ceiling and wall. A hairline crack. Extreme close-up. The crack slowly lengthens half an inch, then holds. End of Act 1. Act 2. Exterior, Cape Canaveral, morning, TV footage. A heavily wrapped commentator walks toward us, camera, on snow. It's so cold, it's hard for her to talk. 129 years ago, the United States of America launched Apollo 11, headed for the sea of tranquility on the moon, igniting hopes and dreams for millions all over the world. In just a few hours, on the morning of the 16th of July, 2098, mankind once again will look toward the skies. It will place all hopes and dreams in the megastructure that is Clotho. The commentator steps aside, and there, in the far distance, a massive spaceship is strapped onto eight idling rockets. Steam plumes out underneath. It's spectacular. The largest spaceship ever built took all the diplomacy, goodwill, and global outreach possible. Earth was scoured for all fissile material and placed it in this vessel, manned by the most qualified and diverse crew possible in the hopes of finding a new home for us all. Only time will tell whether our future will be survival or extinction. The commentator tries to remain objective, but the message gets to her. Has to stop. Somber. She holds up a hand. Sorry. Can we stop? Darwin? Pause. 
Interior, Dan and Bram's room, lower level, morning. TV screen pauses on the woman putting a hand over her eyes. This bit always gets to Bram. He studies the woman. Suddenly tired, Bram turns the TV off. Darwin, time? It is 11.03 a.m. You coming? No sound from the bed. Dan. Still nothing. Bram grabs an alarm clock and sets it for one minute. Puts it down by the side of the bed and exits. No movement or sound for a beat. Then, an uneven, fuzzy hologram of an emoting opera diva pops on. A futuristic Japanese aria clock alarm. Dan's arm emerges from under the duvet, trying to reach the device, unsuccessfully. With bigger arm movements, Dan finally manages to bat the hologram to the floor. The scene gets stuck in a rut, the hologram flickering. Interior mess hall, lower level, same time. A large pot of cooked, colorful vegetables, mash, bread. Plentiful brunch. Crew members are spread out, most of them hungover. Red and a cooking assistant walk around and distribute scoops of stew into bowls. At one of the tables, Bram, Charlotte, Laura, Captain, and Butch. Kentucky is on the computer screen from the lab. Okay, got one. Go ahead. Dan's sleeping in. All right. An animal? No. Attention goes to Laura. Human? Humans are animals, hun. Thanks, sweetness. Not human either. Nope. Red joins the table. That's everyone. Eat while it's hot. Grace! The crew digs in. A communal groan of pleasure. Charlotte squeezes Red's arm. A warm smile. So good. Thank you. Red blushes, embarrassed but grateful for the appreciation. Okay. Is it man-made? Yes. Is it inside the okay. station? Hey! I got a yes. Still my turn. Captain holds his hands up defensively. Is it inside the station? Captain smiles at Red. Her, at him. They're close. Bram shakes his head. No. The guessing game continues as people eat. Is it a penis? Butch smiles mischievously. Only Ash laughs. Everyone knows his immature humor. You have a problem. Seriously. But nothing wrong with the dick, even if you don't want one inside you. Laura locks eyes with Ash. Just the one, Ash? Is there a dick in this station you haven't had inside you? Charlotte doesn't like the animosity between the two women. Can it fit in my hand? No to fitting in a hand, and no, Butch. It's not a penis. Back to you, Charlie. Above or below the surface? Yes or no questions only, but it's above. Natural material? Hey, it's still my turn. Yes or no questions only? He answered. Count as a yes. Hell no. It counts. Still her turn. Bitch, you always take her side. Charlie, go. Charlotte leans in and kisses Laura. Smiles. I cede my turn to Laura. Okay, I'll take it. Man-made, above the surface, bigger than a penis, bigger than a hand. Laura's about to ask, Is it a 300-year-old giant missing spaceship? Dan is in the doorway, pale, hungover. People look to Bram. He nods. Lotho! Communal. Uh, <laughs> fucker. I hate this game. How did you know? Please. Almost every morning, the same video. 129 years ago, the United States of America launched Apollo 11. Bram is embarrassed. Thanks for the wake-up call. Okay, you guessed it. You think of something. I can barely stand. I nominate Kentucky, and someone can have my portion. Dibs! Butch quickly grabs Dan's bowl. Bram is disgusted with his brother's behavior. Interior, greenhouse, lower level, later. Ash and Charlotte work with a couple of male crew members. They till the soil and manage the crops. Lush, healthy. Crew members trim several plentiful orange trees nearby. One of the men grabs a communal basket for pr produce. Ash immediately pulls it out of his hands. Why would you grab this basket? Can't you see we are using it? Go pick some oranges, find the cucumbers or something. We got the potatoes and this basket. The guy shakes his head at Ash, then walks away to the other end of the greenhouse. That's all right. Keep walking. Did you guys date for a second? Yeah, so? He's dumb as a doorpost. Deaf as a doorpost. Ash doesn't get it. It's dumb as a doornail. And still doesn't get it. Never mind. Not important. 
The women, on hands and knees, sift through the soil. Can't you talk to Laura? I hate that you guys are not friendly. Ashes and credulous. <laughs> she needs a sense of humor. Charlotte sighs. There's a knock on the glass in the door. Behind it, Butch, smiling. He is relentless. Aw, oh, look at him. He loves you. That right there is a problem. Charlotte smiles and waves. Smile and a wave won't kill you. Ash eyes Charlotte, then gives a quick smile and a wave to Butch. Interior, hallway, lower level, continuous. From the back, Butch waves at the window one more time, then turns and expertly swings down the ladder to go below. The swoosh sound is louder. Interior, machine room, bottom level, continuous. Butch descends from above, jumps off the ladder and lands firmly on his one strong leg. A huge room full of machinery, steam puffs, and in the middle of it all, a huge black rubber membrane stretched from wall to wall. It's partly covered in algae. The membrane rises and falls with a loud swoosh, the lung of the station. Butch checks instrumentation, then turns the lung off. Immediately, like a bagpipe, the membrane sags, deflated. He grabs a sweeper and makes his way onto the black rubber. Methodically, he scrapes the green algae off to the side. It's like walking on a trampoline, but he's used to it. Then clicks in a quick-release water hose to a valve on the wall. Interior, lab, upper level, same time. Lucy nurses her son. He's contentedly drinking from his mother's breast. Nature at its best. Air went off. Kentucky works at the other end, carefully measuring various liquids. Meticulous. It's noon. Butch cleans the lung. Ah, uh, right. Lucy eyes the back of Ken, unsure. I think I'm doing better, right? Kentucky stops working. She considers her response. Before she gets to reply, the lab door slides open. It's Dan. Take visitors today? Lucy smiles. Yes, although it is lunch break. Dan eyes the nursing baby boy, sits. That's my boy. A flicker of regret comes over Lucy, covers it. Have you picked a name yet? Lucy shakes her head. Dan gently brushes the baby's cheek, something moving about someone so small and dependent. I'm ready whenever you are. I marked it. Dan picks up the ragged book by the bed and opens it to where it's been dog-eared. Hans Christian Andersen's Fairy Tales. Upon opening the book to the marked page, Dan sighs. Why would you pick this one? You're living it. Where is the magic? If you're too hungover... Dan shakes his head, takes a deep breath. Most terribly cold it was. It snowed. It was nearly quite dark. Darwin. Snow. The screen on the wall next to them comes to life. A video clip of a landscape. Snow coming down, slowly. Lucy watches, mesmerized. Kentucky turns to watch, too. When snow falls, nature listens, whatever that means. My mother used to say it. It's beautiful. You're the only one who's actually been up there. What's it like? Dan indicates the patch on his cheek. Cold. Frostbite cold. Lucy feels bad. Didn't mean to be insensitive. Dan smiles. It was evening, the last of the year. In the cold and darkness, there went a little girl bareheaded and with naked feet. When she left home, she had slippers on, true. But what was the good of that? They were very large slippers, it used to be her mother's, and she had lost them as she scuffled across the street because of the two carriages that rolled by dreadfully fast. Lucy coughs, weak. Her baby boy is half asleep now, in a food daze, still attached to her breast. This won't end well. Dan looks up at Lucy. He isn't sure if she refers to the story or her own situation. Maybe you should rest. Lucy nods. Yeah, a little now. But come back soon. We can't leave the matchstick girl out in the cold. Dan leans in and kisses Lucy on the cheek. The baby too. When he stands, he locks eyes with Kentucky, briefly. Then he exits. Interior Drew's room, lower level, same time. Red sits on the bed, watching Drew work at his desk. The room is sparse but colorful. Juvenile. Old, ragged movie posters. Pieces of cloth, Nepal mountain style tied from one corner of the room to the other. Drew fiddles with the purple memory core cube. Nearby, his video camera. He sits back and presses the keyboard, only static on the screen, disappointed. Fuck. Not a bad idea. Red's horny, but Drew doesn't even pay attention. Gets back to the memory core. The salt has corrupted the controller chip. Maybe your mom will know something? Which one? Let's see. 
Charlie is a biologist, Laura a programmer. Who do you think? Drew looks over at Red. She looks great sitting on the bed, legs seductively slightly open. Red smiles. Drew too. Interior loading bay, upper level, continuous. The large 10-person submersible is being lowered. A power tool idles on the ground nearby. Dan, pressing a button, sips out of a jar of kelp. A million thoughts. He's not in a good space. Then a bigger sip. Then finishes the jar. Opens another jar. Drinks. Then, in a fit of rage, he tosses the jar clear across the room. It smashes spectacularly against the wall. Furious and frustrated, Dan grabs his diver's suit. Interior, Laura and Charlotte's room. Same time. Laura is not pleased. Standing defensively, arms crossed. You're too naive. Charlotte sighs. It's not like that. Look, you can do what you like. I don't pretend to own you. Don't do that. Do what? Make this a big deal. She's a friend. I have no interest in Ashley. You did? Honey. You did. Charlotte is not having this. Grabs running shoes and exits. Laura remains, feeling bad. Interior loading bay, upper level, continuous. Bram enters, just in time to see Dan on the diving platform being lowered into the dark water. The two men lock eyes as Dan disappears into the blackness. Darwin, vitals for Dan. Elevated heart rate due to alcohol intake. Not advisable to dive in current state. Bram eyes the empty jars and the smashed glass on the floor. Darwin, set alarm level at 20% oxygen. Copy that. Bram unplugs the idling power tool and puts it back where it belongs. Turns to leave when he notices it. Sticking out under a covered drum of supplies. A bright yellow bag. Puzzled, he pulls it out. Empty. It wasn't there yesterday. Then he smells something. He sniffs the bag. Oranges. Bram is puzzled. Was Dan right? End of Act 2. Act 3. Interior hallway, upper level, day. Bram walks down the hallway until he gets to the spot where he and Dan met Captain late last night. He stops, then kneels down on the grid. He spots some orange peel stuck on the floor, touches it and sniffs his fingers. Interior lab, upper level, day. Kentucky works with lab gear trying to splice a plant seedling. Detailed work, not easy. Through her cocoon's plastic window, she sweats. It's hot inside the life support system. Uncomfortable. Someone enters behind her. Bram. He checks on the sleeping Lucy, then goes to Kentucky. Hey, Doc. Hold that. Kentucky indicates a tray of sprouted plants. Bram holds it, and Kentucky very carefully proceeds to extract the seedlings, roots and all, transferring them to a bigger growth jar. Bram watches her work. Not making marmalade? Kentucky huh. laughs. Why on earth would I do that? Uh, I thought maybe Captain brought you fruit. Didn't you ask him to stop by last night? Kentucky looks at Bram, tries to assess what he's talking about. Keeps working. Covers. Maybe I did. Their eyes lock. A challenge. Bram breaks first. It doesn't matter. Kentucky finishes. Thanks. I got it from here. Was there anything you wanted? Lucy is sleeping, so no. Bram smiles. Uh, talent light later? Wouldn't miss it. Kentucky looks at Bram's back as he exits. Thinks. Interior hallway, lower level, same time. Ash carries a box of grain down to far end of the hallway. She reaches a door on the left. On it, it once said, prayer room. But some of the letters have been scratched out and others have been added. It now reads, pantry. She enters. Interior, pantry, lower level, continuous. Subtle remnants of a chapel. A crucifix, a star of David, a crescent moon, and other symbols are now used to hang dried food and spices. A kneeling pew has been drilled out to make a tool rack. Ash is pleased to find Charlotte there, taking inventory. Good thing harvest is coming up. It's looking a little sparse in here. Charlotte smiles. Well, if I could stand to lose a little weight. Ash puts down the grain, checks out Charlotte's body. Nope. I think it's just right. Something in Ash's tone is predatory. Ash, don't. Just saying. Before Laura snatched you up, no pun intended, <laughs> compliments got me everywhere. Before being the operative word. Charlotte gently pushes Ash back. Okay. Okay. I get it. Do you? Ash backs out. Later. No. Not later sex. See you later. Oh, then yes, later. Ash smiles as she exits. Charlotte shakes her head. 
Ash is attractive. Interior control room, upper level, same time. Laura is hunched over topography maps and specs of the station. Captain leans over her. There's no way of knowing where the communications disconnect happened. Our best bet is the probes. If we could change their output, we may be able to get a message to Domus Glacialis via the antenna by Exodus. Captain is intrigued at the notion. Possibly. Flora would know if there are others, if she's still alive. Oh, crazy old bat will outlive us all. Yeah, well, you would know. Laura knows she may have gone too far. Captain ignores the comment. Trust me, she's alive. Laura studies Captain's back as he sits at the helm. Interior pantry, lower level, moments later. Charlotte has sorted out the pantry and puts the log back. After checking the thermostat, she shuts the light off. Interior hallway, lower level, moments later. Charlotte exits the pantry and slams the door behind her. About to turn up the hallway, she hears something. Stops. Very, very faint. She dismisses it. Starts to walk again. Then hears it again. She stops, cocks her head, listens intently. Two steps back. Can't be. Ringing. A telephone? Charlotte tries to figure out where it's coming from. Then it hits her. Stunned, she turns to the large closed door with a yellow warning tape across it. Alpha, Beta, Omega, Delta. She can't believe it. Hesitatingly, goes to the door, puts ear to it, listens. Nothing. Listens more intently. Not a sound. A hand grabs her shoulder, making Charlotte jump. What are you doing? Crap, you scared me. Sorry. No, uh, I'm sorry. You were right. Laura puts her hands on Charlotte's face and pulls her in for a kiss. A lovely moment. You should have seen yourself. Eyes as big as saucers. Charlotte glances at the big door. I thought I heard something. Both women listen. Nothing. It was kind of ringing. I, I think I... Laura goes in for another kiss. I think you need to lie down. Charlotte smiles. The couple walks up the hallway, leaving behind the thick door to the shutdown area of Galapagos. The light in the east lower hallway is switched off with a loud clank. The large sealed door looms in the dark. Silence. Interior Drew's room, day. Now naked, sweaty, sitting by the desk, Drew fiddles with the memory core again. Red lies under the covers, bed hair, watching him. Drew looks up at the screen, hopeful, yet again, only static. It ain't gonna happen. Drew focuses on the cube. Sometimes you sound like your dad. You know that? Red smiles, but somewhere the comment stings. Because I call it like I see it? Because you forget about the process. Even if nothing comes of this, it feels good trying. Red doesn't get it. I'm going for a run. Drew doesn't comment, stays focused on the memory core. Red, naked, gets out of bed and puts on exercise gear. Exits. Montage of main characters. Red. Runs on the charred, but still functional, treadmill. Butch takes a shower, enjoying the hot water. Captain, in the mess hall, plays backgammon with a friend. Charlotte and Laura cuddle in their living quarters. Ash rakes soil underneath orange trees in a wide-brimmed sun hat. Dan, in the diving suit, re-enters, stares up at the camera angrily. Bram, in control room, eyes Dan on the camera. Kentucky sleeps upright in her life support cocoon. Lucy quietly plays with her baby. Drew tries one more time, not much hope left, checking the screen. Static, until a sound of a woman talking. He can't believe it. Guys, guys, guys! Interior conference room, upper level, later. Drew's heart rate is through the roof, super stoked. Sit, sit! Captain enters, along with Laura, Charlotte, Bram, and a few other crew members. Drew fiddles with his mini-computer with the purple memory cube <coughs> attached. Charlotte and Laura love their son's enthusiasm. Okay, so nothing was coming through, but because of the size of the circulatory and parts, damage is a frequent issue with my attempts on these cores. Soldering irons have the potential to burn or melt the printed circuit board, make the recovery much more difficult. True. Okay, okay, prompts! Dan enters, gives Bram the stink eye. What you got? Okay, so I had reconnected the board faults, but nothing worked. Last, last thing I could think of was the prongs. If they're not properly connected, the memory chips and or other components could be damaged due to power surge. Anyway, 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 you fixed it? Drew turns to the wall computer. Darwin, play file 0769. 
The computer on the wall comes to life. Heavy pixelation. Everyone watches the large wall screen, curious. As usual, nothing happened. But then... A voice emerges from the static. Cogimos una llama. Everyone pays attention. This is exciting. Spanish, right? He looks to Captain, excited. Captain nods. I think she says, they caught a llama. Then, suddenly, an image forms on the screen. A ruddy-faced woman wrapped in colorful textiles appears. A number tag on her shoulder. 11087. She's in a large hangar of sorts, a shelter packed with thousands of people, bunk beds. It's freezing, her breath visible in the cold air. The woman eyes someone behind the handheld camera. She gets up, excited. Vamanos. Let's go. Static. Cut to. Screen. Surface of earth outside. Dark blue sky. Ice partly covered the hilly landscape. Reactions from everyone in the conference room. More crew members enter. Sit to watch. Leans forward. Futuristic structures. More hangars. To the side. Hard to make out. A pile of bodies. A crowd has assembled. Yelling. Hooting. The woman, 11087, points off in the distance. Camera zooms in. There, far away, hunters surround a frightened llama. It circles itself, then settles in the center, ears flicking, unsure. A laser is fired. The llama drops, dead. Heavy pixelation. Drew fiddles with the file. The picture reforms. Cut to inside the hangar. A man appears, wrapped in a blanket, number on shoulder, 20992. He sits on a bed, nestling a baby. The baby sucks on his finger. Se parece a ti. She looks like you. A loud sound of a horn. The man turns to a massive screen that lights up. Loteria. Rapa nui tomara veinte mas. Loud cheers erupt. Rapa nui can take twenty more. Parul, veinte ma. The man looks at the child with hope. Si o Dios quiere. No numbers appear on the large screen, one by one. Suddenly, a yell. Si! Sí, vamos! The camera pans to a man standing with his wife. They hug, ecstatic. The image dissolves into pixelation. That's all I got. End screen. The Galapagos crew is excited. Rare evidence of the past. From the year of selections. Drew beams. The man's number was picked. They got to go below. Yes. Charlotte picks up on Captain's tone. Yes, but... Yes, but the Rapa Nui hot vent was weak. It was one of the first stations to go dead. Harsh information. A downer. Puts the video in a whole different light. Mortality. Eventually, Bram gets up and pats Drew on the shoulder. Well done. Thank you. The file belongs in Domus Glacialis. Really? You think? It's history. Bram smiles, then exits. Dan squeezes Drew's shoulder. Well done. Then follows Bram. Interior hallway, upper level, continuous. Dan is right behind Bram. Thanks for the premature oxygen alarm. Brought me in earlier than necessary. Bram stops by the shaft, spins around to Dan. You drink and dive now? Yeah, you should try it. I'm not doing the rehab thing with you again. I want you out of my space by tonight. Dan didn't see this coming. Harsh. Wow. That escalated fast. Dan pushes past Bram to the shaft going down. Dan! Dan stops. Looks up from the ladder. What? You sure your father didn't come from the lab? Cap. Oh, for fuck's sakes. Why? You don't remember. Don't talk to me like I'm five. Bram has had enough. Turns and leaves. You definitely came from Loden Bay. Bram slows slightly as he registers the answer. Walks on. Interior conference room, upper level, same time. Drew packs up his presentation when... Did anyone feel that? Everyone looks to Charlotte. Feel what? Charlotte? Wait. Nothing. Then, a vibration. Everyone felt at that time. There. Captain stands, suddenly alert. Interior control room, same time. Her shift at the helm, Ash takes her sun hat off. She, too, felt the vibrations. Focused, scanning the screens, she does a double take. Leans forward, worried. Punches in a bunch of data. Gets a different screen. There. Ash's eyes widen, adrenaline pumping. Fuck. She punches a large button. Deafening alarm sirens blare. Blue lights blink. 
Jet stream, I repeat, jet stream, stations, everyone, stations. She hits the exterior light switch. Interior hallway, upper level, same time. Outside the round hallway windows, lights come on. Water is roiled up, large debris rushing by in the strong currents. The alarm is loud. Without warning, the hallway shifts. Something large has hit the exterior. A crew member stumbles. Support beams in three. Interior hallway, lower level, continuous. Red emerges from the gym. What's happening? Jet stream, stations, two. Interior control room, upper level, continuous. Ash is sharp, focused, hands on levers. One. She slides the levers up. Montage. Across the station, steel beams slowly rotate out of the floor, creating a spider's web of supports to reinforce walls. Underneath all the noise and movement, a subtle sound. We move out of the control room, down the hallway, through the steel beams, tracking the sound, past the conference room to the shaft. Crew rush to get to their stations. Down the shaft, past a climbing crew member, to the lower hallway, past living quarters. Sounds clearer now. Past shower room, past mess hall, all the way to the pantry. There, we slowly turn. Coming from behind the thick door to Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, a telephone rings. End of Act 3. Act 4. Interior hallway, lower level, as before. The piercing alarm, blinking blue lights. Steel beams finish sliding out of the floors and click into place, providing additional structural support. A sweaty red, still in workout clothes, taps in a code to the greenhouse. Butch and Dan rush up the hallway, weaving through the spiderweb of steel beams. What's going on? Jetstream! The fun never ends! Butch swings down the shaft below, adroit like a big monkey. Red enters greenhouse. Dan rushes up the ladder. Interior hallway, upper level, same time. Captain emerges from the conference room with Drew. Bran meets them. Stations, go! Captain proceeds up the west hallway to the control room, maneuvering through the steel beams. Dan emerges from below. I got the lab! Drew rushes off, weaving between the steel supports. I got loading bay, you okay? Yes, go! What's with the melodrama? Just go! Dan turns down the east hallway towards loading bay. Bram! Bram rushes to the conference room. Loud sounds from the exterior as objects bombard the station's walls in the violent current. Interior conference room, continuous. Laura and Charlotte struggle to secure a support beam stuck halfway out of the floor. Can someone shut off the damn alarm? Bram appears in the doorway. Bram! Over here! It's stuck! Bram sprints over to the women, pulls at the beam. Above, in the upper wall, the hairline crack. It is holding. Then, with a snap, extends an inch. Bram looks up and spots it. He realizes the serious danger. Laura! She looks at him, and he indicates the wall. She sees it too. Instant dread. Pull! Harder! Charlotte, Laura, and Bram give it their all. Interior, lab, same time. Alarm is blaring. The baby cries. Drew rushes in through the thick door. Drew, over here! Lucy struggles to hold up Kentucky in her cocoon. A hissing noise is proof that air escapes from the life support. She came off the rail! Drew jumps on a table and manages to reattach the cocoon to the ceiling rail. Got it! It's on the rail! Lucy collapses. Get her to the bed! Drew lifts Lucy off the floor, but then stops, frozen. He just points at the large window. In the floodlights, an old car, VW Beetle, tumbles towards the large window in the raging jet stream. Will it smash through? Kentucky and Drew instinctually turn away from impact, but the car just disintegrates into a cloud of rust against the thick glass. With a quick glance at Kentucky, Drew lifts Lucy over to the sickbed. Interior control room, same time. Ash keeps an eye on everything. On screens, we see various locations of the station. Captain, leaning in over her, studies the info. It came out of nowhere. Nothing seismic. Are we holding? A holographic map of the upper level structure appears. Ash sees it immediately, stunned. She points to the conference room on the map. There, a breach. No! No what? She looks up at Captain. It won't hold. Captain realizes what she's saying. Somber rushes back out. Interior conference room, continuous. Bram, Charlotte, and Laura have only managed to move the support beam a couple of inches. They keep an eye on the wall crack. Someone cut the fucking alarm! A large exterior object hits hard overhead. A frigid water spray sets in from the extended crack in the wall. This is serious. Captain appears in the doorway. Out! We're sealing this room! Time to go! We'll get it! Pull! The ceiling springs another leak. Water flows into the hallway. Leave it! Captain hesitates, then runs in and joins the last ditch effort. Slowly but steadily, the steel beams move out of the floor. Interior loading bay continuous. Platypus, the submersible, swings subtly in its chains, movement from the ceiling. Danielle's excited, fatalistic, alive. He makes sure the support beams are clicked in, locked in place. The water from the diving platform raises and dips with the strong exterior current, splashing up over the floor. 
Interior hallway, upper level, same time. Water rushes over the metal grid flooring from loading bay. A few cockroaches appear, floating to the surface. The water goes down the shaft to the lower levels. Past the lower level, water continues down to interior machine room, bottom level, continuous. Water comes down from above, drenching Bram, who is struggling in a tough battle to keep the water off the black rubber lung. Using his scraper, he does everything he can to prevent seawater from getting into the machinery. What the hell's going on up there? Hey! He falls on the slippery rubber, tough on one leg, but gets right back up, pushing water to the side. It's freezing. Interior conference room, same time. Water spray is coming in stronger from the crack. Shut the hatch! Now! Bram rushes out. Interior hallway, upper level, continuous. Bram gets to the shaft and climbs down. Securing his legs into the ladder, he turns a handle on a manual churn as fast as he can. Slowly, a thick seal emerges. Soon the hatch is in place, cutting off the lower floors from the upper level. As water stops gushing down, mere drips now, he waits. Interior conference room, same time. Keeping an eye on the growing crack in the upper wall, Captain sees the futility of what they're doing. He calls it. That's it. Let's go! Charlotte nods in agreement. Laura! Laura, too, realizes it's done. Fuck it. Let's go! All three give up and rush to the door when Charlotte remembers something. Drew's file! She stops and runs back. Charlotte, no! Leave it, Charlie! No time! Laura and Captain can only watch from the doorway as Charlotte grabs the memory cube by the screen. Success! Hope he'll thank me! Screw hope! Move! Now! Above Charlotte, the crack makes a loud noise. All eyes on the ceiling. Instant terror. Laura looks back at her wife. They lock eyes. Then, with the force of a fire hose, water penetrates the wall, instantly pushing Charlotte to the far side of the room. Her back snaps. She screams in pain. Charlie! Water gushes out into the hallway, past Captain and Laura. Laura is about to run in when a hand stops her. Shut the door! Laura is stunned. What? I can get her! Dan appears behind Captain. Shut the door! No time! Yes, there is! Dan tries to push past Captain, but he blocks access. Captain struggles to pull the heavy metal door by himself, tough with the escaping water. No, let me in! I can get her! Captain blocks Dan's access. Help me! No! Captain! Steward! Dad! Laura eyes Charlotte struggling in the freezing water, the buckling ceiling. Then, she also reaches in, slowly pulls the door shut. What are you doing? Pull! Charlotte realizes what's happening. No! Please! Charlotte struggles to keep her head above the gushing water on the far side of the room. Dan is stunned, doesn't move. Laura is distraught, her face distorted in emotional torment. Captain and Laura finally manage to shut the heavy door, sealing the room. Water rushes up the door window on the other side. Laura locks eyes with the terrified Charlotte. Love. Laura puts her hand to the thick glass. The room implodes. Laura screams. Water fills up the room instantly. The door trembles from the force. Shivering in the freezing water, Captain and the others watch the door. Will it hold? It does. But directly below the conference room. Interior, greenhouse, lower level, same time. In a long field of abundant agriculture, amidst support beams, Red eyes the rumbling ceiling. She knows something bad has happened upstairs. Very bad. Terrified. She eyes the ceiling. Please. It's holding. 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 Then, a hairline crack appears. It grows longer. No. An inch, then a foot. A drop of icy water squeezes through. Red watches the drop hit the soil next to her, no, in no. disbelief. No, 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 no. The drop gives way for a fine spray. Incredible pressure forces the water through. Then the fine spray becomes heavy spray that covers the lush landscape, drenching Red. She locks eyes with another crew member. Grab what you can, now, with roots! Realizing there's no time, Red and the other crew member desperately yank up plants with roots, as many as they can hold. Bright oranges, cucumbers, tomatoes, it's a losing battle. Water sprays from the widening crack. Get out! Interior hallway, lower level, continuous. Red and the crew member exit the chamber, drop all the produce, and slam the door shut, pulling the safety lock. Helplessly, they watch as the water level slowly rises through the small window in the door. Someone turns the alarm off. The sudden silence is deafening. Montage. Across the station, the chaos settles. Control room. Ash sits back in disbelief. On the holographic 3D map, two rooms are flashing red. They weren't before. The greenhouse and the conference room. Lab. Kentucky tends to Lucy. Drew sits with the baby, no longer crying. Hallway upper level. Dan turns to his father, furious. Will he hit him? Dan punches the wall next to Captain's head. Laura sits on the floor, legs pulled in, in shock. Shaft. Bram straddles the ladder right under the hatch. Machine room. 
Butch is soaked, steam coming off him in the cold. He finally collapses, no water on the lung, which continues its hypnotic breathing. Hallway, lower level. Red sits with her back up against the flooded greenhouse door, arms full of plants, produce, and total disbelief. Stunned. Silence. Disaster. Black.